Mark, it's good to see you back up here. After a little hiatus post-baby, uh, great to uh, have you leading among us. We're so thankful for all of our music leaders who serve us in this way, all of our musicians, folks behind the scene who just help us as we look to worship the Lord through song. As we begin this morning, let me pray for our time in the Word, and then we'll dive in. Oh Lord, I pray that you would help my brothers and sisters feel their need this morning for you to speak by your Spirit, that we might not only be hearers of the Word, but those who do. Lord, we are thankful this morning for the assurances of your word that it will not, once going out from you, return void. We are thankful, Lord, that your word is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing even those most intimate places of joints and marrow. Oh, Lord, it penetrates. It's, it, find its, it finds its way into our hearts. It exposes us for who we are. It points us to our need for the Savior. And so, Lord, we come to it a needy people this morning. Not by might, nor by power, but by your, my spirit, says the Lord. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, come and do your work among us now, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. A year ago, I found a, an article on the Business Insider about rags to riches stories. They're, they're absolutely fascinating. They're about people who go from nothing to worth, net worth of billions of dollars. And there are some fascinating stories on this article. I think it gave me 16 or 17 different stories of people who had nothing and now they have all that they could ever have dreamed of. Oprah Winfrey, she goes from poverty to worth $3 billion today. J.K. Rowling goes from accepting welfare at one point in her life to being worth a billion dollars. Francois Pinault goes from high school dropout to having a family net worth of 39.9. So I thought, okay, well, that's the family. How much is this guy worth in particular? It's just, it's, you got to lower a little bit to 24 and a half billion for him. Poor guy. The owner of Forever 21, Don Juan Chang, went from janitor, gas attendant, coffee barista, to being worth $3 billion. And then you have the account of uh, Andrew Carnegie, that great American industrialist, who went from living in the house of a weaver, a house where they didn't know where their next meal was coming from. Sometimes the weaving was good, and sometimes the weaving wasn't good. And he goes from living in the house of a weaver to being worth over $300 billion when adjusted for inflation. Just absolutely incredible. Mark, is there something you need me to do mic-wise? Am I coming through okay? No? Check, check, check. There we go. Good. Just want to pause there and make sure we're all good. Thank you, Mark, for all that you do behind the scenes. These uh, rags to riches stories make us marvel. Just think about the contrast between what these people used to wear and what they're wearing after they're worth billions. Think about what these, where these people used to live and then contrast that with the palatial homes that they are now in now that they are worth billions. Think about the contrast between the food they eat, the car they used to drive, the opportunities they used to have, the people that they used to be in connection with in contrast to after they came into the riches of luxury. Think about the vacations they used to go on or maybe couldn't afford to go on and then they became billionaires and the vacations that they are now going on. Everything changed when they made it big. The contrast between their former lives and their latter lives is absolutely massive. And we're captivated by these stories. That's why articles are written about them. That's why biographies come out about all of these sorts of people. The change in status, it causes us to marvel. 
And there's something in each of us that so desires, so wishes that some sort of status change would happen to us. Maybe not on the billions of dollars scale, but there is something in each of us that desires transformation, a status change, even just to a small degree. But here's the thing. All of these people's wealth will or has failed them. They lay on a deathbed, and their wealth could not comfort them. They were buried six feet under, and their wealth could do nothing for them. Some people with billions and with millions lose all their investments. The market goes in a place that they did not anticipate, and they lose businesses. They lose assets. There is no permanency or security to their status change. It, it lasts only for this life, if even that. But when Scripture speaks about this same concept, change in status, it speaks about a status change that is both permanent and secure. It speaks of riches that are of such incalculable worth that you cannot ever even dare to put a price on them. And these riches are freely offered. They are available to everyone. And it is a rags to riches account that we get this morning in Galatians. Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 to 7 is the recounting of a rags to riches story. And the final verse of our text before us, verse 7, summarizes the argument of the text. Look with me at verse 7 really quickly before we get into uh, the rest of the meat of the text. Paul says, so you are no longer a slave, rags, but a son, riches. And if a son, then an heir through God. Paul wants us to see a contrast. He wants us to see what the triune God has done to bring slaves into sonship, into belonging as children of God. This is a rags-to-riches account, and he simply wants us to marvel. And that is my plea, that is my prayer for you this morning. Even as I've prepared this text all week, I have been praying, Lord, help us as a church to marvel at this rags-to-riches account. Help us to marvel at the fact that we were once slaves and now we are children of the living God and you have done it all. Father, Son, and Spirit have worked that we might become children of God. Let's take a look at this text, but before we do, let's read it together. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Here's what the Spirit says through Paul. Paul says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he's the owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, also, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Remember where we are in the book of Galatians. We finished the first two chapters. In the first two chapters, Paul defends his apostolic ministry. He defends his apostolic ministry because the gospel is at stake in Galatia. Some false teachers have come in, and they have started to say, Jesus Christ, yes, he's the son of God. Yes, he died for your sins. Yes, he rose again from the dead. But here's what you need to do. You need to add the works of the law to Jesus Christ. In other words, you are going to make Jesus Christ insufficient because if we add anything to Christ, we say that he is not 100% sufficient. So these false teachers have come in, and they are undermining the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says, do not believe that gospel. It is no gospel at all because it is no good news at all. 
you must believe the gospel that I preach to you. And I have apostolic authority. I did not receive this gospel from man. I received it in a revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. You must believe my gospel. Otherwise, you undermine Jesus Christ and his sufficiency as Savior. That's Paul's argument in the first two chapters of the book of Galatians. And then, as you get into chapters 3 and 4, chapter 3 and 4 are a defense of Paul's gospel. And what we find in Galatians 3 and 4 is that salvation, Paul says, and he argues this from Scripture, is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's his argument in this middle section of the book. He's going to apply his argument in chapters 5 and 6. Sean's going to take us through much of that. But right now we are in the period of Galatians where the gospel is being defended. And so he defends it from the Galatians' experience of salvation. Did you receive the Spirit of God, Paul says to them, by adding the works of the law? No, 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 no. You received it by faith alone. He defends it by pointing to the pattern of Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15. He says Abraham didn't get circumcised. In other words, obey the works of the law, as it were, um, initially. No, 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 Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness, and then he got circumcised. It was faith that, that, that made Abraham, that declared Abraham righteous. He points to the nature of the law. He says, no, the nature of the law, it, it condemns us in our sin. And so he is arguing again and again for the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ and how we must have faith alone and we must, uh, all of our salvation is by grace alone. As last week we saw Paul arguing from salvation history about how Jesus Christ is sufficient. He looked back at Abraham. He said, all of these promises that God made to Abraham, all of this salvation that God promised to Abraham is not nullified by the law. The law had a different purpose. And then Jesus Christ came and it all made sense. It, the temporary nature of the law all made sense sense. And so now as we get into the first seven verses of chapter four, Paul builds off of these themes, these themes as he's looking to defend the gospel. And he shows us, he shows us that salvation is, yes, by grace, through faith, in Christ, and that there is this radical, radical contrast between our former lives and the lives that we now have now that we stand in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul gets to his conclusion in verse 7, the, the, the verse that we read, so now you are no longer a slave but a son. He gets there in two steps. Two steps which make up our sermon outline this morning. The two steps are Paul goes over the former time. Before Christ came, he talks about where the Galatians were at in the former time. And then after Christ came, when the fullness of time had come, he talks about where the, what the Galatians have been added to now. And so we're going we're gonna to treat this text in the two steps that it provides for us. First, let's look at verses 1 to 3. Paul says, in the former time, we were slaves. Friend, do you remember when you were a slave? A slave to sin. A slave to this world. A slave to your passions a slave to your pleasures. Paul says, look back with me at the former time. In the former time, we were slaves. He begins this section of the argument with an illustration. He picks up the language of an heir that we are exposed to at the end of chapter 3, and he uses it as an illustration. He speaks about a minor, a, a young child, who is not yet fit to take over the inheritance of their parents. There's a provision in the British monarchy um, that's called, uh, that, that, that's referred to as a regency. So if the heir to the throne is under age, or if the king or queen is absent or unwell for some reason, a regency takes over for the monarch. They manage the affairs of the kingdom if the monarch is unwell or absent or under age. And so very hypothetically, here's how this works. If King Charles and his son, Prince William, were to pass away suddenly today, Prince George, William's son, now 10 years old, would be king, but a regency would rule the kingdom until he is 18 years old. He would be 
Prince George would be under guardians and managers until the time of his 18th birthday. That's essentially the illustration that Paul is using at the start of this text. He says an heir, as long as they are a child, cannot enter into their inheritance until they reach the set time by their father. They are under guardians and managers until that appointed time. Until that time, they are no different from a slave, even though they technically own everything because they haven't come into their inheritance yet. The heir... The child is living under authority, just like the people of God lived under the authority of the law for a set time, until that set date that the father would send his son. That's the illustration that Paul's using. Paul then applies that illustration, look at verse 3, to the Galatians. He says, folks, this is you. This is all of us. We also, in our former lives, look at Paul's wording, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Now this phrase, elementary principles of the world, speaks of the fundamentals that the world operates by apart from Jesus Christ. Anything that the sinner looks to apart from Christ is an elementary principle of the world. This is sort of old creation, old self territory. And this phrase is used twice in Galatians, it's used once in our text, it's used once next week, it's used a couple of times in Colossians, and it's always used in close proximity to speaking about the law, speaking about rituals, speaking about idolatry. Look at, look at next week's text, look at uh, chapter 4, verse 8 to 11. Paul says, formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, you, how can you turn back, again, to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? There's that phrase again. Whose slaves you want to be once more. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. Paul uses this phrase again in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Don't revert back to those practices, back to those rituals, back to that worship that characterizes this world, that is set apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Later in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, if with Christ you have died to the elemental spirits of the world, why? As if you were still alive to the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, according to human precepts and teachings. Paul says, don't go back to these rituals, to this idolatry, to this way of life that is not Jesus Christ. That's what he means by the elemental principles of the world, the old ways that we used to view life with, that we were under slavery to, don't go back to it. Friends, this morning, as we look at this phrase, it's helpful for us to realize that worldliness is slavery. Worldliness is slavery. Those who have not bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ are enslaved. They are enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. They live their life by the beat of the world's drums. They live life for themselves, for their pleasure, for their success, for their comfort. They are their own God. They do what seems right to them. They live by what seems right to them. They live according to the elementary principles of this world. And the Bible says it is slavery. We're all following something. We're all chained to something. And the Bible says that those things that we follow, those desires that we have apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, are enslaving. They dictate which way we go. They dictate how we make decisions. They dictate how we talk. They dictate how we think. They dictate how we dream. They dictate how we invest our money. They dictate how we take a job or don't take a job. All of those things that are apart from Christ, when we are not in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are living for self, for pleasures, for desires, they dictate which direction we go, and they enslave us, the Bible says. Christian, do you remember the slavery that you used to be under? We were formerly slaves, slaves to our appetites, to our lusts, to the ways and to the whims of the world. We were enslaved to our passions and our pleasures. 
slaves to what the world counts as success, whatever we wanted out of life apart from Christ, we were enslaved to that. I hate thinking about my former life. I absolutely hate it before I was in Jesus. Because I see so clearly as I look at those years that I spent apart from Christ, how I was enslaved to my own passions and pleasures. And I see where that slavery could have brought me. Paul says, remember the former time. Don't go back to the law. Don't go back to rituals. Don't go back to the idolatry of this world. Do not listen to the elemental principles of this world. Something else has taken place. In the former times, we were slaves. But something happened to change our status. This is where the marvelous work of our triune God comes in. And so that's our first point. We see that in the former time we were slaves, but the text takes a radical turn. Verse 4 all the way to the bottom. It says that in the fullness of time we are children if we are in Jesus. In the, for, in the fullness of time we are children if we are in Jesus. You know, salvation history called out for a savior. I don't know if you've ever read the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. If you haven't, you really should. You should make that a goal in your life to do it a number of times, not even just one time. As you do that, you realize that salvation history calls out for a a savior. All throughout salvation history, people in slavery to sin, self, the world, death, and Satan are calling out for a savior. As you read through from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Salvation history is saying we need something better than what we have. Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3 is the fall of man. Man and woman rebel against God. There's this promise that the seed of the serpent or the seed of the woman would rise up and crush the seed of the serpent. There is the first gospel promise. And from that point on, people are going, we need this Savior. There is this longing. There is this expectation. We see it all the way through the book of Genesis. If you were with us in our series through the book of Genesis, you see that at every turn, God's people are looking for this second Adam, this Savior who will come and rescue them from their sins. As we make our way through the book of Exodus, here's what we're going to, here's, here's the pressure that's going to mount as we get to the end of it. We're going to go, wait a second, Moses, he's a, he's a good mediator, but boy, we need a better mediator. As you start to work your way from Leviticus to the end of Deuteronomy, you see priests, God's gift to his people, people who are able to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people so that the people can have their sins forgiven. And as we go through, as you go through the book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, here's here's the urge that you get. You go, wait a second, these priests, they're flawed people. Some priests offer sacrifices that they weren't authorized to offer. And the Lord wipes them out. These priests are imperfect, flawed people. How do we know? They've got to offer sacrifices for themselves before they offer sacrifices for the people. And you get to the end of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and here's what you say. We need a better priest. We need a true and better priest. Then you start to read through the historical books about a sixth of your Bible's mass of pages. And you start to see that God provides a king for his people. But boy, as you get to the end of the historical books, you go, these kings are flawed. They don't rule God's people the way that God intended them to rule his people. And even the best of the kings are sinners. David sleeps with Bathsheba. David takes a census he shouldn't have. Solomon splits the kingdom. And by the time you get to the end of the historical books, you are crying out, Lord, give us a king. That's not like these other kings. And then as you read the prophets, the people of God are, under, are in exile because of their sin. And the prophets are declaring the hope of God, the judgment of God. And you get to the end of the prophets and you go, God, send your savior. We need a better prophet. We need a better priest. We need a better king. We need a better mediator. And in walks Jesus. In the fullness of time. God sent his son. That that phrase, in the fullness of time, means there is relief. There is joy at the exact right time. In the time appointed by God, oh, God had a date circled on his calendar. And he said, that is the time where I will send rescue. 
And we are meant, as we looked at verses 4, 5, and 6, to sit back and marvel at the work of our triune God. Because in the fullness of time, he sends a better prophet, priest, and king. He sends a better mediator. He sends the Savior that all of salvation history has been longing for. And this particular, these particular verses unpack the glory of the triune God one person at a time. The inseparable operations of our God are on display in this triune rescue plan. This status change is, uh, is, is a work of Father, of Son, and of Spirit. Don't miss that as we read through it. And so look at the glory of the triune God on display as the fullness of time is described and marvel at each person of the blessed Trinity. Marvel first at the work of the Father. Look down at the text, verse 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son. The Father planned and promised salvation from eternity. He sent the Son as the Savior to be the better prophet, priest, and king, the better mediator. And in John's gospel, we get this language again and again and again of Jesus declaring that I have been sent, Jesus says. I have been sent from the Father. I came as a willing sacrifice to die on behalf of the people that they might be redeemed. Friends, we have a God who loved us. He planned our redemption. He sent his Son. Remember those beautiful words that we all probably have memorized. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. He gave his son. Paul bursts out into praise in the first chapter of Ephesians as he thinks about the father's role in redemption. The father sent his son. And Paul says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The Father's sending of the Son should inspire our praises. Our status change is a work of the Father sending the Son. And this is love and grace to marvel at. Bless the Father for sending the Son. But then the text goes on and it further describes the work of the Son and it says marvel at the work of the Son. Look at the four phrases that Paul stacks up upon each other as he speaks about the work of the Son. He was born of a woman. The apostle John said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, Jesus became Man, I love the words of the Nicene Creed, the anticipation that they build as you're reading through this confession of the early church. The the Nicene Creed starts by speaking about Jesus' divinity. It says, he is God of God, light of light, very God of very God. And then it turns and it says, who came for us? And for our salvation, down from heaven, he condescended. I love that term. The one who is transcendent. The one who is glorious. The one who pre-existed all things. The one who has never been made. The one who is the second person of the Trinity for us. And for our salvation, took on human flesh. Philippians chapter 2. Paul is speaking to the church in Philippi. And he says, this taking on of flesh is the greatest, the greatest display of humility. Christ humbled himself. He emptied himself. Now, that's not an emptying of his divinity. He didn't take his divinity and sort of like throw it out and divest himself of it, put it on a hanger, hang it in the closet, and say, I'm just going to put on humanity for now. No, no, no. This emptying himself is an emptying by addition. He added a human nature to himself. It's an emptying by addition, not an emptying by subtraction. And theologians talk about this as the humbling of the Son, one of the greatest displays of humility ever. Jesus got hungry. Jesus got thirsty. Jesus got tired. He suffered. He passed from infancy to childhood to adulthood. He experienced all the particularities of humanity as a man so that he could be our substitute, so that he could represent us. On Calvary's cross. He was born of woman. 
you know, in pr- preparation for tonight's interview with uh, Ewan Gallagher on a Christian response to physician-assisted death, I read this quote from Ewan's book, and it marvels at the incarnation. I'm just going to read it to you. It's, it's wonderful. He says, the most shocking idea in the Christian religion, an idea foreign to all other systems of belief, is that the utterly transcendent God who existed outside of time, all-powerful and all-knowing, the self-existent one who needs nothing from anyone or anything, should condescend to be in our midst as one of us. In Jesus, God becomes man. It is almost unimaginable that such a God, high and lifted up, should dwell with us, should be concerned for us, should know us, and should care for us. It feels like the ultimate too-good-to-be-true fairy tale story. A kind of wishful thinking on steroids. Conscious as we are of our limits, our imperfections, our frailty, we are naturally inclined to believe that God is interested in us only in proportion to what we have to offer Him. The thought that He still cares for us when we have nothing to offer is simply unbelievable. Except for, we do need to believe it. Because it is actually true. Friends, God cares for us. He wants us to dwell with him. He wants us to fellowship with him. And so Christ condescended for you and for me. He took on flesh. Behold the love of God for you. Look at the next phrase that Paul stacks up as he speaks about what took place in this fullness of time. Jesus was born of a woman, but he was also born under the law. So many people thought that Jesus was coming to be a conqueror in a militaristic sense. He's going to come and he's going to wipe out the Romans. And Jesus did come to be conqueror, but not in a militaristic sense. He came to conquer in a way that no one had imagined. He conquered through his obedience, his active obedience. He obeyed the law perfectly. Remember, the law exposes us. It highlights our sin. It shows us what wicked hearts we truly have. Not so with Christ, though. He comes and he perfectly obeys the commands of God. He loved God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. He loved neighbor as himself. He is the true and better Adam who does not give in to temptation. His temptations in the wilderness show that. And that's why Peter can declare in 1 Peter 2.22, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. He did what we could not do. He came to live under the law and he lived it perfectly but look at the next phrase that paul stacks up about the lord he was born of a woman born under the law and he came to redeem those under the law we were imprisoned we were enslaved we were unable to obey the law the law exposed our sin and jesus comes and conquers yes by his active obedience and obeying the law but also by what theologians call his passive obedience being obedient to the point of death even death On a cross. Jesus didn't go to the cross reluctantly. He didn't go as a helpless victim. He goes voluntarily. He goes willingly. You know, ever since the first Passover, there had been a search that the people of God had to go on year after year after year, time after time after time, epoch after epoch. They had to go searching for a lamb, a blameless, spotless, pure, undefiled lamb. There's always this search going on. Can't have a blemished lamb. And Jesus walks in, and John the Baptist looks at him, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He came to redeem those who were living under the law, whose sins were exposed by the law, who were shown to be empty and void of any sort of righteousness. And in walks the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. This is sacrificial love to marvel at. And then look at the height of Paul's statement about Jesus. God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that the result, we might receive adoption as sons. You know, the late J.I. Packer, who wrote that classic work, Knowing God, he summarizes the New Testament in three words. Could you do that? Summarize the New Testament in three words? Here's how he summarizes the New Testament. He says, he 
calls it adoption through propitiation. In other words, we are made, we are brought into the family of God through Christ's death on our behalf. Christ appeasing the wrath of God. Adoption through propitiation. The New Testament is always speaking about that. At 10 out of Paul's 13 letters, he cites God our Father. Father is not just like a tack on to who God is. No, no, no. Father is only true of those who have been added to the family of God by virtue of the death of Christ. Paul talks about God our Father all the time. The Lord's Prayer, it is a marvel. Think about how the Lord's Prayer starts. Our Father, Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, and he says, start in this way. Our Father. We could stop there and we could preach an entire sermon on those two words. Why? Because you can only call God your Father if you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Adoption through propitiation. It is a, a wondrous reality. The Bible wants us to know that we are incorporated into the family of God. We have the closest relationship possible with God the Father because of Jesus Christ. Because he came and redeemed us from under the law's curse. You know, family is, a, is, is as close a relationship as you can have in life. That's why if you go to like a wedding or you go to a funeral and someone's introducing you to someone else, you go, ah, this is my aunt and uncle. They're not really my aunt and uncle, but, you know, we were so close growing up that I call them aunt and uncle. Or someone might say, you know, so-and-so is my spiritual father, or so-and-so is my spiritual mother, or, man, this guy is my best friend. He, I mean, we're brothers. We're pretty much brothers. We describe people in familial terms because family is as close a relationship as we can possibly have. And the wonder of wonders is that in Jesus Christ, God attaches himself to us in that way. And not artificially, not conceptually, not hypothetically. But we actually become part of the most intimate group that belongs to God. Isn't that a wonder? He came that we might receive adoption as sons. What security in life? What love? What joy, what privilege, what rights come with that? And so we marvel at the Father, we marvel at the Son, and then look at verse 6. We marvel at the work of the Spirit. We've seen the work of the Father, we've seen the work of the Son, now we are appointed to the work of the Spirit. And because you are a Son, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Children would use this phrase in the household, to refer to their fathers. This is an outcry that denotes intimacy. It denotes belonging and affection. The Spirit assures us that we are God's children. And because we are chi God's children, we can go to the Father at any time, night or day. Think about this for a second. You know, pretend there's a child in an office setting. His dad's a an executive of a company, and he's meeting with a bunch of other executives from other companies. They're trying to bridge a deal. It's a very important meeting. A child arrives at the office with his mother, and they're just waiting outside for the meeting to stop. Now, any employee in that office setting, if they are to even go near that door and interrupt that meeting, they're in trouble. This is an important meeting. We're trying to bridge a deal. It's a major deal. But if a child, three, four, five years old, opens up that door and runs to his dad, Nothing's going to be wrong. Dad's going to laugh. Dad's going to be so, he's going to be so thankful that the kid is there. Okay, son, like, it's, it's time to wait outside the room. But he's going to want to embrace his son. That kid can go to that dad in the most inappropriate of situations that no one else could get away with. Friend, do you realize this? We can go to our father any time, night or day, in any situation that we are facing. Sick, suffering, distressed. Scared, anxious, overwhelmed, tempted, needy, mad, sad, bad, glad, whatever we are facing. We can go to our Father. We can cry out to Him, Abba, Father. The Spirit does that work. The indwelling Spirit comes into us. And He, 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 he helps us to burst forth in affection for our Father. In Mark 14... Jesus uses this very phrase in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember what Jesus is doing. He's on the verge of going to the cross, and he's praying before God. He knows that the cup of God's wrath is going to fall upon him at the cross, and he is in agony over this. 
And he cries out in deep distress to his father. And what are the words he uses? Abba, Father. What are the words the Christian uses when Christ saves us and the Spirit indwells us? We cry the exact same thing. Why? Because we are in the Son. And we have that close relationship to the Father. Friends, being saved by the blood of Christ and joined to him by faith, we have the Spirit poured into our hearts and we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit cries out, Abba, Father. Talk about a change in status. From hostile to God to calling God affectionately our Father. From rags to riches. And Paul's conclusion, verse 7, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I was exposed to a story this week through uh, a a commentary that I was reading um, from John Stott. And the story is of John Newton. I love John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, those, those, those words that have lasted a lifetime because of their profundity. And John Newton in his former life was quite the sinner. He was an angry man. He was known on board a ship of sailors for being more profane than any of those sailors. I mean, there's that common phrase, swearing like a sailor, and everyone says, well, John Newton does it in a way that like trumps the way that any of us do it. He was, he was a man who was given over to witchcraft for a time. He was part of the slave trade for a while. It, you, know, it, you read any biography on John Newton, and it just stacks up how far this man was away from the Lord. He was angry. He was hostile. He wanted nothing to do with the Lord. But one night, he's on board a ship, and it's quite a stormy uh, night. And John Newton is scared for his life. This eternity's. I'm on the cusp of eternity. This ship is going down. And he cried out to the Lord for his salvation. The Lord saved him. And and John realized as he went throughout his Christian life, he would always look back at that moment and he would go, man, it's just so easy to forget what my former life looked like and what God has done now. And so what John did was he took a verse of scripture. He wanted some words that he could reference And put over top of his mantle in his study so that he could see them every single time he was in his study. To be reminded about what God had done. And he wrote these words from Deuteronomy 15.15 on this plaque. The word said, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. John wanted to remember I have been brought out of slavery, and I am a son of the living God. I am redeemed. Friend, do you have those sorts of reminders around you? Do you remember your slavery, not so that you can dwell in it, not so that you can be disappointed by it, not so that you can despair in it, but so that it points you to the work that the Lord Jesus Christ has done in your life, and so that you can say as a result, I'm forgiven, I'm redeemed. I am saved. I am regenerate. I am united to Christ. I am a child of God. I am walking in the light. I am transformed. I have Christ as my Savior. I have God as my Father. I have the indwelling Spirit as my assurance. My status has been changed. I have gone from rags to riches. And all of this by the grace of God. By faith alone. In Christ alone. Friend, if you don't have those reminders... Think about that this afternoon. You have gone from slavery to a son and daughter of the king. This is something we need to remember. And we remember it through song, even now as the team comes up and we sing together. Let me pray as they do that. Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you have done to bring us out of slavery into what is true freedom. Freedom in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, O God, that as we have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so we would walk in him, so we would rejoice in all that he has accomplished. It is him who has done the work. We have nothing to boast in. And so we give you thanks, we give you our praise, and we pray, Lord, that we would sing heartily, that we would sing with exuberance as we think about all of these truths. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Arise, my soul, arise. Arise, my soul, arise. 
Shake off your guilty fears, the bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne, my surety stands. Before the throne, my surety stands. My name is written 